Hey, everybody. Welcome to a third live show for 2022. I am uh, kind of shocked that we have done this three weeks in a row, although obviously this is not Wednesday. But um, <clears throat> with that out of the way, I have Brian joining me again back from his home base in Atlanta. Say hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. So Brian was out here for a few days. We got to drive uh, some Tundras. We got to drive a whole bunch of stuff. ID4, Maki. <clears throat> um, what else did we do? We had the Subaru Forester Wilderness Edition. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Tucson Hybrid. Oh, yeah, forgot about the Tucson Hybrid. Mm -hmm. And then yesterday I was out driving the EV6, but I'm not allowed to talk about it uh, in any sort of meaningful detail other than how it looks and what it's like inside uh, until uh, Monday. Very sadly, all the European journalists have already driven it, and for some reason they got to talk about it. I don't know why that is, but that's how that worked out. And speaking of EVs, our first topic today is uh, this interesting Cox Automotive survey, <clears throat> the 2021 Path to EV Adoption. I found this survey really intriguing. You can find it if you Google Cox Automotive 2021 EV survey. Um, the We'll go backwards in this because the funniest part of the survey, they surveyed 5,000 people. <clears throat> of these 5,000 people, 70% of buyers nearly said they were not aware that Chevy produced any EV at all, even though the Bolt's been on sale since 2016. Um, oddly enough, 17% of America was not aware that Tesla sold an EV, even though that is all that Tesla has ever sold. Um, and for Toyota, this was really funny. So 40% of shoppers said that they knew that Toyota made an EV, except that when this survey was taken, it was months before Toyota had announced that there would be a Toyota EV. I am I'm blown away by that one. Um, on the sad front here, 38% uh, of consumers say they're considering an EV for their next vehicle purchase, uh, but only 3% say that they're 100% confident their next vehicle will be an EV. So as, a, as our resident uh, on-staff millennial, Brian, uh, is an EV in your future? Well, I, I would love to consider one, but it really comes down to uh, where you live. I live in the city and in Atlanta here specifically, I mean, the closest uh, EV charging station is not far from me. Um, it's at a grocery store, a Kroger uh, parking lot. Um, but after that, and that's Electrify America, I believe. But after mm -hmm. that, there's not one within like two or three miles. Um, so it, it's interesting because Atlanta has so many people and I would absolutely consider one if I could also charge it at home. I don't mm -hmm. live in an apartment complex that has any sort of built-in charging. I know some newer places do, and some older places are adding that. Uh, but I live in a like a National Register of Historic Buildings type place. <laughs> so uh, yeah. my landlord's like, eh, we don't have the uh, space or the infrastructure or any sort of connection or enough power coming here to add something like that in the near future. Um, that is, but that I imagine thing because, uh, yeah. you know, 90% of charging sessions happen at home. So if you right, right, right. don't charge at home or can't charge at home, that, that could be a problem. Exactly, uh, exactly. Also, on this one uh, is that uh, number percentage of college grads considering an EV is really quite high, 61%. Uh, and it's heavily male as well. Mm. So, interesting. Yeah. Interesting theories there. Uh, on the focus on core elements, supposedly what is driving people to consider an EV or not, 23% uh, said purchase price, 20% said range, 17% said monthly payment, same as purchase price, uh, service and maintenance costs, then vehicle styling, uh, was 15% and nowhere on this was efficiency for some reason. And I'm, I always find that really quite interesting. So who knows? Um, but yeah, 57% say lack of charging stations in my area. Yeah, it, it completely makes sense. Um, I just, people don't think that if, or people think that, you know, if I can't go to a charging station as frequently as I can find a gas station, then they're not willing to, I guess, sacrifice, on the range aspect, but at the end of the day, also a lot of the electric cars out there get the ones you can currently get here in the U S they're not hitting, not all of them are hitting 300 miles, but the ones that are 300 miles is about average for what, you know, a lot of gasoline power cars, you know, have in their range. Yeah. It's um, the other th interesting thing on the range here is that the minimum acceptable, the desired range and, and what people thought the kind of range should be has been ratcheting up drastically. So in 2019, I'm not sure how this number arrived. Minimum acceptable range was 184 miles on average. Mm. In 2021, it's now 217, but the desired is basically just under 350 miles of desired range. That's what they want. Um, and 
really that's that's difficult especially if they're talking real world range i can't think of any ev that is currently on sale uh, that will reliably dependably give you 350 miles of range in every situation which is what a lot of shoppers seem to be interested in i just drove today down from healdsburg back here to my office um and it was 31 degrees in healdsburg california and uh, my Mach-E lost about 33% of its range in 30 degree weather because, you know, obviously I didn't want to freeze to death. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. And so when I was just out there with you, um, you know, I haven't been to California too many times, but, you know, I was kind of blown away by how many electric cars I did see and plug in hybrid models. Because out here uh, where I live, you know, you don't, you don't really see too many people doing or going for on the, for mm -hmm. those models yet. Um of course, California is a different situation, but it was it was actually a pleasant surprise to see as many as I did. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds like a lot of people are very much in, you know, they're ready to do it. They just it's it's, it's going to be interesting to see how many people do it once and then continue to buy electric cars after that. Or if they're going to be like, hmm, I didn't like how well, that was. Numbers are me. starting to look good. There was a story. There was a story a short while back that got a lot of press coverage because it implied that that EV owners didn't return to EVs for their next vehicle. But. I was able to snag the data from that survey because it was done by a research project through a public university. So the data was freely available. And uh, the more I dug into that data, the less I liked it. it the data set was extraordinarily small. It's like mm. just over a thousand people. Mm. Um, the data was also quite old. Uh, they were mainly surveying uh, Leaf owners and there were a few Tesla Model S's. So we're talking very early on in the EV game. Um, and at that point in time, by when the data set was taken, the Model 3 didn't exist, the Model Y didn't exist, um, none of the modern crop of EVs existed. So if you were a very early LEAF adopter and you didn't want a LEAF anymore, there, there wasn't anything else for you to do. I mean, you could get right. another LEAF where you could not. And right. if a Model S wasn't in your budget, then you went back to something else. Um, the other interesting thing was the survey did not bother to ask whether their next vehicle purchase replaced the vehicle that they were being discussed, that they were discussing. So the way the mm. question was formatted was you bought this EV. What was your next car purchase? So right, it's like right. if you're a two car household and most EV owners are multiple car households, three or more, um, you replace one car with an EV. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the SUV or the truck that's in your family that's not necessarily going to be an EV next time. Um, so I think there were some flaws with that data. Um, I am eager to find out what uh, the Hyundai Kia Group and um, Ford have recently been talking about. 98% of shoppers return to an EV. I hmm. want to know where that data is coming from because I haven't seen any actual studies on that. But that sounds a tiny bit more plausible. Yeah, and going back to the Toyota, the topic of Toyota and people assuming that Toyota was making an EV when at the time they weren't, you know, I don't, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe some of those people knew about that old RAV4 EV they made for a couple of years. They stopped making that around 2014. It wasn't really, you know, groundbreaking anyway. It was, it had like 103 miles of range. Mm -hmm. It was kind of expensive. I doubt the general public knew about that, but yeah. at the same no, time, I'm, it's I'm funny. No. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny just the people knowing, know that Toyota is the hybrid. Especially you know, when you look at, especially when you look at this data and, uh, 63% of shoppers did not know that Nissan made an EV. They've been making one right. since 2011. They were the first yeah. volume EV in the United States. They they were first, yeah. they were earlier than Tesla. Uh, and 17% of people didn't know that Tesla made an EV when that is all Tesla has ever made. That's all they do. <laughs> all they do. Yeah. Um, let's get to the first question here. Speaking of Toyota, uh, which is when are we going to talk about the Tundra Turbo wastegate problems? Um, this has been sort of anecdotal on forums, and I try and stay away from data that does not have uh, a, a wide data set from. Forums are where problems collect. You can find the most reliable car on earth we'll have a forum where problems collect. Um, how pervasive is this problem? We won't know, un unfortunately, for about a year at least, until we start seeing reliability companies like True Delta, Consumer Reports, JD Powers, et cetera, doing reliability research that is, that is um, uh, broader based. So rather than finding people, do you have a problem? Do you have a problem? What's your problem? They research you know, a subset, a random subset of the market and say, did you have a problem? Um, but I will say that it does appear that some of the complaints are similar to complaints that were registered on the LS 500. 
um, when it got a very similar engine. As I understand it, and I haven't been able to confirm this with Toyota or Lexus because they somehow don't talk, um, it appears that the turbo is the same turbo that is used in the LS, but it's assembled in a different factory. So it could be an assembly issue that will be corrected. Um, I haven't heard of any recalls associated with this, so it cannot be a, a terribly pervasive problem. Otherwise, NHTSA would have requested a recall already. Um, so I think it's an open-ended question. If you're concerned about it, I would delay purchasing one uh, or purchase something different at the moment. Um, but I'm not necessarily overly concerned about it. Every manufacturer can have a stumble when it comes to reliability. Toyota generally does better than others when it comes to first-year launches, but any first-year launch product can have some teething issues. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm a, I haven't even actually seen the forums. I haven't read into the details of that situation. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as we learn more about it officially from, you know, various other sources. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to see how that goes. Uh, yeah. So next up, we have a question here from Jake E about a Passport Elite uh, versus MDX or now a Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited. Um, rarely off-road, but heavy snow and salt region. If you if you don't off road, and I would I would quest I would ask I guess what kind of off roading do you do? Um, I live down a gravel road, and I'm surprised by the number of friends that consider this off roading. Go mm -hmm. figure. Um, it is a it is a paved road. It is just paved with gravel. Um, in that case, any of those three would be just fine. Um, I do like the MDX's interior. Have you been in that recently, Brian? Uh, I haven't been in an MDX. I've been in a TLX. Um, I know they're very similar, just obviously MDX is bigger. Um, but the MDX does get, you know, the full L LCD uh, instrument cluster. The T mm -hmm. TLX does not get that. I and like the those. The dashboard's a little better put together, I think, than the TLX. The TLX yeah. has got some, some plastic mismatches that, that mm -hmm. bug me for some reason. <laughs> um, but I think the MDX is a little more harmonious. Uh, it's definitely fun to drive, too. Um, yeah. Passport has a decent amount of ground clearance. Jeep Grand Cherokee is going to be the more off-road capable. Um, when it comes to heavy snow, tires, tires, tires are your thing. A MDX with a little bit less ground clearance, unless you high center on a snowbank, um, with good winter tires is always going to beat a Grand Cherokee or any four-wheel drive thing with all seasons. So uh, tires are, are by far the most important part of this equation. And if you're stretching yourself budget-wise, I would recommend getting the less expensive vehicle and invest in an alternate set of wheels and good snow tires. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Up next, we have to uh, Tesla's news. Speaking of EVs, uh, did you read this one, Brian? Tesla has uh, said essentially publicly in their earnings statement that uh, no new vehicles will be happening in 2022. <sighs> Yeah, I, I did see that. And uh, the market, the stock market did not take well to it. They, uh, their shares plunged 12% last night. Um, now, some of the other electric car companies really surprised, I, I would have hoped that the roadster would have happened. Yeah, that one's the one that I think had the most promise to be coming this year. And so that is like the biggest shock. I mean, also, the honestly, the roadster and the semi were just you know, I think it was about time that they were ready to come out. And I thought, you know, after everything that was being said and, you know, rumors yeah. and discussions that they were going to be ready. The, the semi, at least there's some rolling prototypes running around right. that other companies right. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know, you know, I followed a couple of people who, you know, put in reservations for the Roadster mm -hmm. as soon as they first announced it. And, you know, they've been tracking the progress on that and doing all this sort of like sharing, you know, reservation information with other people so they can get, you know, credits and things like that and it's funny that that was like the last time i saw yeah. a video on that was two years ago and it's like we if still don't have people, if enough people super chat down there maybe we could uh, put in a pre-order <laughs> for the roadster ourselves all right um the uh i i'm i'm intrigued the other thing is that they have said that they're not working not currently working at all in any respects is how it sounded on the earnings mm -hmm. call uh, right. on anything that is less expensive than they currently sell so no $25,000 Tesla that the faithful had been hunting for. And um, I know people are upset about that, but that is the one thing in that earnings call that makes complete business sense because a $25,000 EV makes zero sense for a small company like Tesla. There's no way they would make money on it. Um, yeah. it, it would be, it would drag down their earnings. They're, they're never, uh, uh, 
they're never a healthy earning company on a, on a running basis. You know, they've got tax credits here and there that that come in and help profitability. But profitability and, you know, and a future, a strong future for Tesla where later they could do things is deeply embedded in expensive cars. So, you know, make more plaids, make that roadster, sell a $100,000 Cybertruck. That that seems to be where they really logically ought to go. And, uh, you know, the uh, average demographics of the EV shop here, they're they're pretty high income earners, according to this Cox Automotive survey. When you look look through some of the data and this bears out with everything else that we've seen out there um, is that you know, average adjusted household income is much higher than a, a traditional ICE vehicle. Yeah. And, and I guess another thing to think about is the existing history of reliability that Tesla owners have experienced, you know, even with the newest models, Model Y, Model 3, people still to this day. You know, I see a lot of, you know, people sharing the issues they've had. And so going down to a $25,000 car, you're going to have to sacrifice even more in terms of, you know, perhaps build quality, perhaps features. And yeah. Tesla's interiors are already pretty Spartan as it is. I mean, they're not, you know, the super mo the most luxurious yeah. things out there. So imagine a $25,000 version. And yeah. even if they did come out with a $25,000 version, it wouldn't be $25,000 for very long because. Oh, sure. I mean, just, it, it, will, you know, it will happen. Eventually it needs to happen. Whether it's a good business case for Tesla to do now or next year, that is, I think, the bigger question. I'm, I'm sure an inexpensive EV that is a solid, decent EV with a $25,000 price tag before tax credits, it's going to happen sometime, mm -hmm. just not soon. Every car company out there is is certainly focusing on the, the $50,000 segment right now because that's where that's where the shopper is and that's where the profits are likely to be. Right. It's a sweet spot. Yeah. yeah, it's a sweet spot. And that's that's EV6, which we should also talk about. So I was able to drive EV6. And it is interesting um, having EV6 and uh, Mach-E parked right next to each other. Um, I think if I can uh, hunt around, I can actually find this picture of them. Uh, they are almost exactly the same length on the outside. Um, the EV6 looks a lot smaller in some photos, but they are very, very similarly sized in reality. And uh, their interior practicality though is quite different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so did you get a chance to sort of you know sit around the back seat a lot? Because you know, the EV6 has more of a sloping or I guess raked roof line, doesn't have the full panoramic, you know, glass roof. It does have that moon roof that opens, which mm -hmm. you know, opens or larger, you know, you have to decide which one you like better, but the Ionic 5 is definitely just a boxier shape. Um, so I'm curious to see, did you, did you get a chance to sort of compare the two based on your memory of the Ionic 5? Uh, I, did. I did. The Ionic 5 is definitely much squarer. Um, mm -hmm. The Ionic 5 is an interesting one because it's it's shorter in terms of vehicle length, has a longer mm -hmm. wheelbase, and the roof line is a little bit taller. The okay. EV6, as you can see in this photo here, uh, oddly, I, I was really intrigued by this combo. And so I, I shot a video on it while I was there um, because there are a lot of commonalities between in just terms of design between the Mach-E and the EV6. They're both trying to be sporty. They're both trying to be this sort of um, coupe crossover -y sedan thing. Um, and both have their own takes on modernity versus a, a nod to the past. And um, the big differences with these vehicles are cargo room and front trunk uh, are, are you know, the easy things to, to obviously know. Um, the hood on, it doesn't look like it in this photo because the EV6 is, is maybe about 15 feet in front of the Mach-E. Um, they are actually the same length. The EV6 is higher off the ground, but the roof line is lower. So the seating position is much more reclined. Um, the front hood is considerably shorter in terms of length than the Mach-E. And it's, the front is about eight inches lower to the ground. So that's why there's no front cargo area in there. They wanted it to look very futuristic, et cetera rather than looking like a traditional car, which has a long hood. They wanted that really short hood thing. Um, but the cargo area is quite a bit smaller. It's like uh, 24 cubic feet versus about 30 cubic feet combined in the Mustang. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and that's, I, that's, that's, that's definitely smaller than an ID4 too, I believe. Yeah. It's a little bit smaller than the ID4, but it has mm. more legroom than the ID4. Oh. Um, the glass roof opens. And it handles much. Well, I can't actually tell you about that. That's... <laughs> much something. Sorry, right. mm -mm. <laughs> I will. I will paint a picture for you. It's got two fifty five with tires from the factory. Hmm. Okay. Um, if you get the lower end versions, two thirty five with tires, and it's two hundred pounds lighter at least than the Mach E. 
Hmm. Okay. Yeah. The bad part is uh, interior space. It doesn't feel as roomy as the Maki or the Model Y. Maki and Model Y are very similarly shaped inside, and uh, it's hard to tell in this photo. But when you look at the greenhouse, it really is. It it has a very uh, very bell shape pro side uh, front profile to it with really <laughs> aggressive wide hip look um, for the big meaty tires. And, and then a very narrow greenhouse on top, and then it curves in towards the back for aerodynamics. So sitting in the driver's seat, um, the, 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 you know, oh shit handle is extraordinarily close to my head. Um, so it, the interior feels a lot tighter. Hmm. And then, you know, as you said, the configuration is a lot different. You know, the ID or the mm -hmm. Ionic 5 gives you sort of the, the more lounge-like setup with things mm -hmm. that can slide around and move and have footrests. Did the EV6 have any of those same things inside? The EV6 has a max recline seat, um, but okay. no ottoman. I actually mm -hmm. didn't okay. find the ottoman too useful in the Ionic 5. Um, the max recline seat I liked, but sure. the Ionic, the ottoman part just kind of hit me in a weird spot. And you you can't really stretch out long enough with the dashboard where it is to make good use of it. So I'm, I'm fine with that part not being included. Hmm. Okay. So uh, let's see here. Concerned Citizen is asking us for opinions on the Elantra N and the Alfa Romeo Tonale. I'll let you handle the Elantra N since you are already sure. an, an owner. I am. So yeah, I currently drive a Veloster N. It's a, so it's a 2019 and it was the base model at the time that didn't have the performance package. Now all the N models have everything that performance package included. So mine is going to be a little bit different if I were to compare it to that Veloster N that I have. But I have driven the, the Elantra N. Um, for me, what blew me away was how solid and almost not luxurious per se, because it's obviously still Hyundai at the end of the day, but the interior design of the Elantra in general is it's much more driver focused. It's much more tech focused. It's something that the interior alone is something I would use as a consideration for upgrading to the Elantra. And now the exterior to each their own, it has, it has design elements that I know some people don't like and then areas that people do like specifically the front grill with, with all the black that they did. Um, they could have toned that back a little bit, I think, but overall it drives yeah. so well. And the DCT, of course, you know, the new automatic that they use, um, it's just lightning quick. It's it's, it's yeah. actually shockingly good. I like the fact that Hyundai has has gone the Volkswagen route and offered the DCT, whereas yep. as Honda is more There's focused no on sign. security. But, yeah. it, but it means that it's a little bit less likely to be accepted by someone that says, you know, I really want a manual, but maybe in stop and go traffic, it's less practical. Right. So Hyundai gives you that option. On the Alfa Romeo Tonale, uh, that will be uh, announced officially on February 8th. So there are a lot of renderings going on around uh, mm. the world right now. I'm intrigued to see what that ends up uh, looking like because it is probably going to preview some drivetrain and platform tech that we'll see in Jeep and other Stellantis family products going forward. So lots of rumors on that, but not a lot of detail. Well, they did actually just yesterday or two days ago, Alpha released a you know an official teaser of the front yeah, end. So there's a picture teaser, out yeah. there. Yeah, it's very yeah. you can't see too much. You can see the LED signature lights and of course the mm -hmm. traditional triangle grill. Um, yeah, but course, from what I've seen, like, terms has of a, has a render now of it, what it should mm -hmm. look like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now everything I've seen of it, the production version that's been spied testing around. Uh, there's there's some elements that look a little different from the concept and of course mm -hmm. it's a concept car and it was a little yeah. bit sportier than what i think this is going to look like but at the end of the day i mean it it's probably going to turn out really good because of course we know the uh, uh stelvio is a fantastic driver's car so if that's important mm -hmm. to you it's probably going to be that and just a lighter smaller package but we'll have to see rumor mill says it's going to be front wheel drive okay yeah yeah i forgot so, about that uh... We'll see. Well, again, just rumors. We had nothing official, but it looks like right. it's probably going to be the platform that is likely going to at some point spread to like Jeep Compass, Jeep Cherokee, maybe at mm -hmm. some point in the future. Right. So Brian, another Brian here is looking for a simple car for seven year old mom. What do you think about Corolla Hatch or Corolla Cross? I would lean towards Corolla Cross um, mm -hmm. because it's it's a little bit more crossover shaped. So the hip point is going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be easier to get in and out and the doors are slightly taller. Um, so unless your mom is, you know, quite short, um, my mom, my mom is like five one. So, you know, on a good day. So, but even she would probably do better in a Corolla cross, I think just as far as ease of getting in and out, um, than the Corolla hatch. Yeah. And the Corolla hatch is interior space wise on the smaller side for its class. It so if, she, if she's looking for, 
you know, room to actually haul things or just carry things around or pick up items from Costco or just larger items. The cross is definitely going to be the way to, the way to go. And I actually, I really like how instead of giving it the Corolla's front end, they gave it more of the Rav Four's front yeah. end design. I think it's prettier cool. too. Yeah, overall, I think it's a little mm. bit more of a I don't know mm -hmm. appealing design on the outside. Now the interior is the dashboard, and everything is almost you know not not one hundred percent, but ninety percent straight out of the Corolla, um, which mm -hmm. is a good starting point. It's when it came out, it was you know. A, a, you know, applauded for having decent materials that are wearing yeah. the design itself is unique. So I think you can't go wrong with that part of it. Yeah. And if you're wanting to save a little bit on fuel, there should be a Corolla Cross hybrid coming soon, but no details just yet. It's been long rumored. It's been all but confirmed by the Toyota people. They sort of wink, wink and say, you know, we can't talk about anything in the future, um, right. but it's, it's basically coming. Uh, Elliot is asking why companies are moving away from physical buttons and door handles. Um, this is an interesting thing. So on the door handle front, the motion away from door handles has a lot to do with aero. So the the more aerodynamic the shape of the vehicle can be, uh, the better off you are, especially with an EV. Remember that in an electric car, um, aero is everything, especially for highway range. And that tiny little bit that is affected by a door handle, you know, might give you one mile on your range longer. And so they're willing to do all of that for, for range. Um, <clears throat> it is interesting when you think about this though, like aerodynamics in a Mach-E or this new EV6, if that was a traditional hybrid vehicle, they probably would be getting very Prius-like mileage for their format because um, it, they're actually arguably more aerodynamic than a Prius uh, in the way that they're, they're shaped and styled, et cetera. Um, on the physical button things, I am told, according to designers, that this is based on customer preference, that customers like the clean... Um, touch button look. They're used to iPads and iPhones and Android tablets, etc. And so they claim, at any rate, that this is focus group derived. Derived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've actually, you know, asked people about this before and done my own little surveying on it. And especially people younger, closer to my age, uh, they, you know, we grew up with technology that's very touch based, and so I think it sort of comes natural to mm -hmm. people who are a little bit younger. Um, so that might be a driving factor for that. Um, yeah, so it's but in terms of clean. It is easier to clean, um, um, and it probably costs a little bit less for the manufacturer to have, for example, one panel instead of. This is an interesting panels. question. Not mm -hmm. necessarily. So oh, it depends not? on how. Yeah, it depends on how the touch buttons are done. So okay. if the touch button has a physical element in it or haptic feedback, like we find okay, in Volkswagen yeah. products, mm -hmm. then it's more expensive than a traditional button. If it it's a touchpad that does not have either like the buttons that Honda was using on the dashboard and some products a while back, then it's less expensive. So it just depends mm -hmm. on the touch button. Yeah. And, and in my they, experience, I don't hate them as, I mean, yeah. there are some that are less responsive than others, but it doesn't I don't bother really me too it. much in the EV six. I did the EV six is definitely one of those ones that's more expensive than physical buttons because mm -hmm. they not yeah. only have the touch buttons, but they also have an LCD that is integrated into the touch button bank with, you know, various uh, icons that change and you can swap it yep. from climate control to audio and navigation. And uh, that is a little bit touchy because it's where some of the buttons are located. And if you're trying to go for the knobs, they, they left two physical knobs and one is for uh, the right and left climate control zone or tuning right. and power and volume. And if you accidentally touch any of the touch buttons around it, as you're grabbing the knob, it can change modes. So that is a yeah. little bit tricky there. Yeah, I can imagine that's a little bit uh, what well, could be annoying if because if you're in the climate setting and you go to turn it thinking you're going to do the volume, you're going to end up turning mm -hmm. the fan or yeah. you know, the fan of the temperature um, and vice versa. So that could yeah. I mean, once you're an owner of those cars, I'm sure you would figure that out. Yeah. But I mean, there know, are first... there are egregious touch button issues, examples yeah. out there like yeah. the first Honda uh, touch dials on the steering wheel where the volume slider was there. And every time you turn the steering wheel in a city kind of parking maneuver, you were yeah. moving the volume way up or way down. That was awful. And they thankfully killed it. Uh, yeah. Vic is asking here, how do we feel about the ID buzz? Uh, the, if you haven't seen these details, everyone, I encourage you to Google the leaked images for ID buzz, which have already popped out. The interior yes. looks like a large version of the ID four. So the dashboard, steering wheel, et cetera, very, very ID four. And the second row is more crossover than minivan. Yeah. So if you actually go to alexonautos.com, I did write there we go. a daily post about it. So I've got the pictures and I've linked the source to them. Um, yeah, it's obviously it's going to be sort of every ID model is going to have that same interior design theme. And it's, 
it's, it's very it's colorful. colorful. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's cheerful. It's sort of got bright colors. And I'm wondering if, because the one we saw or the pictures that you'll see, if you look at the, the particular mm -hmm. pictures we're talking about, it had orange panels on the inside. And I'm wondering yeah, if they're going to yeah. pull, if they're going to pull an FJ cruiser and make those panels match the exterior color. Cause obviously it was we'll camouflage. It is know. supposed to be a cute, fun, modern bus mm -hmm. thing. Um, yes. I am intrigued by the lack of minivan practicality that the photos in, uh, indicate, though. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's the the floor pan and the profile of the vehicle uh, don't quite match in my head. You know, the profile is supposed to be this this modern microbus, but mm -hmm. now that we've seen the inside, the second row seats sort of fold and tumble forward like a crossover, where the footwells yeah. down here and the seats are up here when they're folded. Uh, it doesn't look like they come out of the vehicle at all. And that likely means that the third row, if it has one, one assumes it has a third row, uh, won't come out of the ID buzz either. So that means that it's not going to be an electric replacement for, you know, the Sienna, the Carnival, the Odyssey, the Pacifica, Voyager, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I'm a tiny bit disappointed in that. I really had hoped that it was flat floor, removable seats so that could be you know the 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 cool camper van conversion that everybody wanted or or you could take the seats out and have your dogs back there that kind of thing having the seats stay in the vehicle means you've you've instantly lost 10 to 12 inches of vertical space yeah and in those pictures there's no sign that there's a third row in that particular model there's no seat belts in the mm -hmm. d pillar unless the third row has you know seat belts built into the actual seats yep. but there's also just a completely flat single panel down there in the third area third row area so it looks like that mm -hmm. one didn't have a third row but at the same time also i don't know if you ever i can't remember if you ever checked out the last nissan quest the very last version they mm -hmm. made of it when it got yep. really boxy it this setup looks very similar to that where the if you go yeah. to the lip or the edge of the hatchback area, the floor is completely flat with that, unlike an Odyssey, a Sienna, a Chrysler, right. you know, all those where there's a well and the third row seat goes back there. Instead, the third row seat just folds down, kind of like your typical yeah. you know, crossover. Yeah. And then there's that flat floor that's level with the lip there. Mm -hmm. So it's it looks like it's doing that sort of thing. I have I, a feeling the ID Buzz is also going to be smaller than people are thinking. If, oh, yeah. if it has a third row, I'm guessing it's going to be Tiguan third row, not Atlas third row sized. And dimensionally, based on what we've seen now from the interior and the way that's all laid out, being very, very ID4 looking and sized, I'm guessing that this is not going to be Atlas dimensionally on the outside either, or, or obviously American minivan, which are actually bigger than Atlas. So it's, I don't think it's going to be what some Americans were hoping for. And it's also possible that it will fill, the, I don't know, obviously this car didn't sell super well, but if you remember the Mazda yeah. 5, that was a tiny little minivan. Even even, even the Kia Rondo, which wasn't That's really a minivan. Where it's it's going to be maybe a little bit bigger than that, but I suspect, yeah, it's going to be close mm -hmm. to that. You know, yeah. and, and Closer to that. like a, you know, a, a Peugeot MPV in Europe, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. same size thing, but with, you know, retro bussy styling. Yeah, yeah. Now, I have no doubt that it'll look pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we'll have to see how they treat the colors and the outside and the two-tone stuff. That'll make or break it, I think. But overall, it should be a pretty cool-looking car. Yeah. Here's Drew McReynolds uh, asking about uh, VW Group ditching the flagship project. Um, inside big conglomerates like Volkswagen, it is really interesting to see how some of these projects work out. Uh, the, the sort of Inside baseball talk is that it was decided and agreed that Porsche's EV tech was more suitable for their performance mission rather than the Volkswagen stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of why we have the Audi GT thing with the Porsche battery tech, right. um, because their missions are different. Uh, so I don't think that it was, you know... Porsche having a temper tantrum, although obviously that can happen because um, Porsche is definitely definitely treated differently inside the Volkswagen Audi group envelope than Audi is. So let's put that out there, too. Um, mm -hmm. but I suspect it had more to do with performance and an agreement with Volkswagen that, yes, performance is a is a thing that we need to care about. Um, EV batteries and EV cooling, it's it's definitely a difficult thing to do. Like other companies are very, very conservative about EV cooling and, and all of that, which is why we find like unbridled extend mode in the Mustang Mach E GT. Um, must unbridled extend doesn't mean more oomph. It actually means less oomph. It just means that the battery will be re power output from the battery will be reduced to a level that the battery can maintain for 
X percentage of the battery. Um, if you want the fastest zero to 60 time, it would actually be in any of the other modes. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Ford is very concerned about, you know, what happens if the battery overheats. Um, there's not a lot of data for real world use on these EVs yet because, you know, they're just, they're brand new. So as Ford collects data about how the battery is managed, how it's used, et cetera, it's likely that they will adjust these sorts of parameters and profiles over time. Uh, for instance, we're already seeing that Mach-E customers soon will be able to access a little bit more of their battery. So the uh, the dual motor version that I have will go from 270 miles to 277 miles of range for 2022, and older vehicles will get that update. Um, they've also realized that cooling was a little bit better in the pack than they had originally thought, um, and they're less overheating concerns. So they're going to be allowing uh, greater charge rates at some point in the future, also with less of a charge taper after 80%. Um, so it's all a learning curve. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on here. Who's next here? Oh, uh, thank you, RX Knox or RX Nov, Nov. Nov for your uh, super chat there. So thanks for that. Um, let's move on here. Uh, here we go. Video of the ID buzz in the wild can be found on Bjorn. Yep. So that is yes. that is a good thing. We are already starting to see some of those uh, things get broken here. So uh, hopefully we will uh, we'll see the the full embargo break at some point here soon. Um, yeah. yeah. So hopefully hopefully that's a thing. I saw somebody who who tacked on to the crawl across crawl a hatch question. Let me find it. But they were saying throw in the Mazda three hatch back into the equation. What do you think of that? Here we go. Yeah. Um, I like the Mazda 3, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I would get it for my mom. Um, that infotainment system is far from intuitive with the knob. Mm -hmm. Not a fan. Yeah, uh, I love the way the Mazda 3 looks, um, but I would probably say CX-5 or upcoming CX-50 would be a little bit better for someone <clears throat> that might have mobility issues a little bit later. If you're thinking this person's going to hang on to the car till they're 80, um, think about how they can, how well they can get in and out now versus how well they might be able to get in and out later. And again, a lot of this depends on the size of person. So if this is a shorter person, then a more traditional hatchback might be more appropriate. Um, but if they're maybe, you know, five, eight, five, nine, something like that, then, uh, a, a small crossover, a low to the ground crossover is probably going to be easier. Um, and in that vein, I would probably recommend something like a soul before I Mazda three'd. Not because of the looks, because the Mazda 3 is prettier, um, but because that the sole is going to be easier to get in and out of. It's very square. The doors are quite tall. It has a higher hip point, uh, et cetera, for easier entry. Yeah, and that CX-50 um, that we mentioned, that's their newest crossover model that will kind of be, for now, parallel to the CX-5, but very similar in size. That just went into production this week, so we should be seeing it pretty – like, we should be taking a look at it very soon, I'd assume – um, so do stay tuned if you want to like get the full <laughs> Mazda situation um, covered because that'll be the newest option from them. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Um, someone here is asking. This is an interesting question, Jason. Do you think yeah. a Hyundai? Basically, this is a this is a little bit a little little Hyundai RV. So do you think mm -hmm. the little Hyundai RV would succeed in the U.S.? I am intrigued that we don't actually have more mainstream companies doing things like this. Yeah. Um, Let's see if we can find a picture here for people that are wondering what this looks like. Um, it, other car companies have have sort of tried some of this, but it's been quite a long time. Um, let's go here. Uh, you can get a Mercedes-Benz yeah. Sprinter van or even their... Uh, oh, what well, this is, is what they look like here. Yeah, I mean, you can get a Mercedes Sprinter van, but from the factory, um, it's not quite the same. Mercedes does yeah. it and then Sprinter converts it. So right. this is much more in the family as far as who's doing it. Um, and you can see it has kind of like the little little cutaway truck front end. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by Hyundai's attempt at this here. Um, but I doubt that they'll bring it to the US. This The RV market's really unusual. Um, and very insular, so very, very under the control of converters and things like that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What, what is interesting, I, I would have expected with the pandemic, because I think data shows that 
especially last year in 2020, people mm -hmm. started buying RVs out the wazoo because they couldn't go, you know, do stuff with other people. So they're like, okay, yeah. we'll go take our home situation mm -hmm. and travel and see the sites and stuff. So I don't know if that's, I haven't looked at the data recently, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if those sales have tapered off, but I'm surprised somebody didn't yeah. in that moment try to jump on that. But even if they had, we wouldn't see yeah. something this soon. It would probably be you know, coming in the future, but I haven't. I would be interested to see such a thing. I think that the problem in the U.S. market for that specifically would be the lack of lack of active safety systems mm -hmm. um, that it has, because uh, it's based on one of their commercial truck platforms. So it's not going to drive or ride like a Hyundai minivan. Um, it's going to be very you know box truck driving. Um, mm -hmm. And it may or may not be based on a box truck engine design, et cetera, that is acceptable for the U.S. Um, as far as emissions and crash compliance goes. Um, so that would be the question, I think, there. Um, I would love to see them do it, though. Let me put that out there. Uh, Scott has a Chevy Bolt he'd like to upgrade, but it isn't ur urgent. Is there EV tech coming out that is worth waiting for? Ionic 5 is tempting. Um, I would say if you are concerned about DC fast charging at all, then I would buy an 800 volt based EV for my next EV. Um, yeah. That's that's probably the biggest, most important update versus your Bolt. Range on the Bolt is pretty decent, actually. It's over 200 miles if you treat it nicely, which is usually... Uh, within the realm of what most shoppers are after. You'll get a little bit more range in the newer EVs, but the faster charging is the bigger thing. Um, you know, Chevy Bolt, if you really want to drain the battery all the way, charge it all the way full, it's going to take, you know, a uh, little more than an hour uh, to do that at a 50 kW station. If you had an Ionic 5 and you want to go from completely empty to completely full, it's like 28 minutes, something like that, 25 minutes. It's very, very short. And the 10 to 80% range, that 70% battery fills only 18 minutes. It's much, much faster. Um, and that that charge window gets you further too. Especially if you're taking mm -hmm. a look at the rear-wheel drive Ionic 5 or the rear-wheel drive EV6. The EV6 is is swoopier. That really low front end and the tighter body is what gets it to 310 miles of range. Um, so yep. it's it's that's definitely going to be a thing. Um Tesla has not decided to join the 800 volt bandwagon because this would be a major investment for them in battery tech, in onboard conversion, and in station design. But I would assume it's going to happen at some point later because in order for Tesla's average charge rate to go to the next level, they're going to need to go to an 800 volt system. Um, they do very, very well for a 400 volt system. They're the fastest 400 volt charging vehicles available. Um, but it's likely because of the 400 volt design uh, that they cannot maintain a, a fast charge rate for as long. So when yeah. you look at average charge rate, how the average average kilowatt charge rate from 10% to 80%, there are several EVs now that will charge faster on average in that window than a Model 3 or Model Y. Yeah, and there's a video I recommend you check out. Um, it's <clears throat> Matt Watson at Carwell, who's over in the UK. He mm -hmm. does a test of um, he basically drives all the current crop of EVs until they completely run out of juice. And um, of course, there are some models in there that we're not getting here and the specs and you know how they do things with the electric cars over there is a little different, but it might give you a good idea in terms of range on these models that we're getting. Um, and I won't spoil which one wins, but it's one of the two Hyundai Kia group cars. So that one's a cool video to watch if you're interested. Um, now... Since Alex and I just looked at the Sequoia and the Tundra in person, and we've uh, gotten a <laughs> close look at them, I know this is the issue of the day is why Toyota didn't give the Sequoia that same brake handle mustache situation that the Tundra has, which for me personally, I didn't, especially in certain grades, when you see it on like the capstone or some of the other trims, it doesn't show up as prominently based on if it's chrome or if it's body right. colored. Um, but I do agree the Tundra's treatment is a little bit, I don't know, I don't know what the best word for it. It's not classy or anything. It's just it works a little bit better in terms of closing off that bottom of the grill. I don't know, Alex, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I think I like the Sequoia's look a lot better. It is sort of a blend of of RAV4 and Highlander with the Tundra. And the, the pork chop, you know, look is not my thing on the Tundra. But I will say the capstone looks a lot better because the capstone still has the same grill, but it doesn't have the funky chrome sad face around it. Um, but I do think that you could put the Sequoia's front end on the Tundra because the hood and the fenders are the same 
and the front suspension is essentially the same. So I would be interested to see if there are any conversion kits out there at some point to put a new nose on your Tundra. Um, that would be that would be an interesting twist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a good question here on EV charging. Um, when will we see wireless P heavy EV charging like BMWs done with or Speedtail? Um, there's a good reason for for not seeing this, and I if I were a betting person, I would say either never or only in very limited instances is this ever going to happen. Two big reasons for that. The first one is weight. So having a huge inductive charging coil on the car is going to weigh more. Uh, and weight is the enemy of efficiency. It's the enemy of range, et cetera. Um, positioning that in the vehicle, having more than one coil so you can drive over things, that is that gets a little tricky, especially for higher charge rates. Inductive charging works okay if we're talking about you know an iWatch or a smartphone, things like that, where we're not talking about a lot of power. But in a car where we're talking six, seven, eight, nine kilowatts, this is a, this is a lot of power, um, and we're talking about a lot of loss and a lot of heat that has to be rejected. So these these loops wouldn't just be static loops. Most likely, they would have to be liquid cooled loops. So you have additional weight from the liquid cooling, um, and you have the fact that charging efficiency through wireless systems is generally speaking, they're working on this, but is generally speaking around 85% efficient. So, you know, again, if you're charging your iPhone and you have to waste 15% of the energy to pack it in your iPhone, it's not a big deal. It's not a lot of energy that you pack in your phone uh, or your tablet computer or whatever. But if we're talking about charging a car that's got a 100 kilowatt battery, 100 kilowatt hour battery, this is a lot of, of wasted power. Uh, it's a lot less efficient than simply plugging the vehicle in. Um, Safety wise, it should be safer because you could have sealed coils, et cetera, and that shouldn't really be a problem. Um, relative efficiency changes based on where the coil is located. So you want, you need your coils to be very close together, perfectly aligned is the other problem too. So now we're talking about a coil that's on the vehicle that is either stationary with the coil in the parking spot that's moved, that has to move to find it, et cetera. So as far as complications go, there are quite a lot of them. And the easy, simple answer is just plug it in, unfortunately. Well, so actually, Alex, uh, Hyundai is working on this. The, the, GV60, on the Genesis yep. GV60 will be the first model, the first electric model to get wireless charging. There's a company called but Ytricity. Not in the US. <laughs> but not in the US, only South, South Korea. Yes. But the GV60 is coming here, and it's the first mm -hmm. model that we know of that's yep. coming here that even gets it at all. So yep. there's potential and it's coming here, but probably not for a while. But South Korea will get it first. And it's, it looks like it's going to be a novelty there. And the charge rates are quite slow because they still haven't worked out a lot of these kinks, uh, which is why it's not coming to the US there. Um, they haven't really said, let's see here, they haven't really said what the wireless output ability will be other than it will probably be six to seven kilowatts, which will be decently slower. Mm -hmm. And then of course you're losing 15%. Um, and a lot of details are still sketchy. I would not be surprised if that didn't end up actually happening. Let's put it that way. Most of the wireless charging experiments that we've seen have kind of failed. Mm. Uh, how will 2013, uh, sorry, 2023 cargo space compare 13. to Tahoe? Uh, it's going to be smaller. There's no way around that. Uh, no independent suspension, battery pack between the third row and the frame. Uh, cargo area will be smaller. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Best three row full size SUV in America, other than the hundred thousand dollar vehicles. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, I would say it's hard to go wrong with the General Motors triplets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, really, they're all pretty good now. I mean, before the current generation, I would have said it would be harder to pick a clear winner, but the current expedition and yeah, the current GM um, triplets, um, even if you get into Especially if you get into like the lower level, uh, yeah. you know, Escalades that aren't aren't over a hundred thousand dollars. I I feel like that's not what you're trying to group in here. But of those lower models, mm -hmm. uh, right now I, I'm going to say yeah, the GM, the GM three kind of offer a little bit of they're everything, the, and they're really the only the the main ones that are modern that will yeah. get decently below a hundred thousand dollars like right. you can theoretically buy an escalade that is under a hundred thousand dollars then you can theoretically buy a wagoneer yeah. that's under a yeah. hundred thousand dollars but the bulk of them are going to be real close to a hundred thousand yeah. dollars um 
the uh, the Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer were really designed as Yukon Denali and Escalade competitors, not Tahoe Bourbon Expedition competitors. So the pricing is, is quite divergent there. Um, the Expedition's a little bit old to me. Um, I think it needs more than the minor refresh that it's gotten. Um, if you're looking for bang for the buck, uh, the Nissan um, SUVs are pretty cheap. They're cheap, but they're also like... <laughs> The least, they're like the least yeah. up to date. They're the lowest yeah. technology. So I mean, that's important they to you. They do sell well, but there's a reason. I mean, cheap, cheap sells. So. And I and I agree, and I actually like what they did with the refresh, especially of the uh, the um, Armada. I like mm -hmm. sort of the sort of flatter, more uh, angular look to the grill they did that they're doing with their other cars too. I think it works well. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I wouldn't pick that over the other ones unless yeah. price is yeah your issue. Price price is a big thing. Price standard towing. Standard V8, um, you you do get more for your money there in that one. As long as we're talking about the base model, but the moment you, you want get a V8, a more, yeah, the one moment you want a bit more, you're probably better off with the others. JP mm -hmm. is asking if air suspension will play a bigger role in the EV space. I suspect it will, because air suspensions and adaptive suspensions, especially, help compensate for the the added weight. Uh, every mm -hmm. EV is pretty heavy. Batteries are heavy, and they're positioned differently in the vehicle, et cetera. And air suspensions really take a lot of the sting out of that, which is why the Model S rides nicely, but the Model 3 and Model Y don't really, in my opinion. Um, it's because the suspension dynamics there, there's not a lot of suspension travel. They don't have an air suspension. Um, I-Pace rides nicely. Uh, Mach-E GT Performance, I think, rides better than the Mach-E. The regular Mach-E has that same firm and bouncy thing that we find in other big battery EVs. And the only solutions are adaptive suspensions or more suspension travel. So like ID4 rides very nicely because it's much higher off the ground. There's a lot more suspension travel to damp the motions um, or lose weight. That's the other option. Um, MX-30 rides nicely because it's fairly light. Um, so all those things are going to definitely factor into future EV development there. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, why do journalists always dump on Mitsubishi? Is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Outlander is a great new EV. A great SUV. Um, I think you know Mitsubishi has struggled here and there. Um, you know, the they still have some questionable products. Yeah. Um, Nissan, the Nissan ownership has definitely improved. I like the Outlander. The Outlander looks good. It's yeah. it's great. Uh, it's a discount Nissan Rogue. Absolutely nothing wrong with that there. Um, some of the other product line though, that's a little bit tricky. I mean, why would you get a Mirage and not a Nissan Versa or something like that? Right. Why would you right. get an Outlander Sport over other things in that segment? And, you know, say what you will about the name, but the Eclipse Cross is actually, you know, not the worst thing you could get out there. I mean, it's a unique mm -hmm. design. I see quite a few around uh, and the refresh it just got mm -hmm. has a much improved interior with they got, they, yeah. they tried to copy the Lexus, the old Lexus NX with its interior. It looks mm -hmm. like ripped straight out of an NX and it had the same sort of touchpad. Yeah. This refresh they just gave it got rid of that. So now in terms of mm -hmm. user, you know, ease of use on the interior and stuff like that and value. It's actually not a bad choice. Um, yeah. I mean, it has that little tiny turbo engine, but it's not super slow, actually. I mean, it's not like archaically slow or, or, or you know, glacially slow, um, as some mm -hmm. people might assume it is. It's it's not the worst car you could go for right now. Actually. No, my problem with the Eclipse Cross isn't the car, it's the price tag. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not cheap enough to say I should buy this instead of insert most of the newer competition in that segment there. There's yeah. nothing... There's nothing wrong with it, and price fixes everything. And that's that's you know part of my thing with Mitsubishi is the and like the Nissan Versa, like many inexpensive vehicles, as long as the price is low enough, everything else can be forgiven. You know, if it the the, the Mirage is fine as long as it's the least expensive car in America because it has a niche and set your expectations appropriately, it's just fine. In the middle group of things where we have the Outlander Sport and the and the Eclipse Cross. That's where things get trickier because, you know, why would you buy an Eclipse Cross over uh, a Kona or a Seltos or honestly a Chevy Trailblazer? I think the Trailblazer is yep. is better and it's less expensive than the Eclipse Cross. Now, Consumer Reports actually just recently uh, put out a or just they they um, did a survey or they do this survey, I guess, every year. But they mm -hmm. the Toyota CHR, which is a, an Eclipse Cross competitor, is the number one you know, it's the top of the list for cars owners regret buying. So mm -hmm. that's interesting because it's a Toyota and it's got all the typical uh, Toyota aspects of it. But it sounds mm -hmm. like, you know, the Eclipse Cross didn't make that list or at least at that high. 
Um, I don't so think there's enough data on Eclipse Cross. Uh, Consumer yeah. Reports, the the pool of vehicles pulled for them has been shrinking and sh shrinking and shrinking over time. It's it's about a quarter million vehicles less than it was about a decade ago. Um, and so there's not a lot of data on a lot of models. That's that's yeah. an important thing, um, especially a lot of American models or or smaller brands. Um, their data sets are too small now to even publish some some reliability reports. Hmm. Um, so if you're interested in reliability, you should subscribe to Consumer Reports and get them their data. Uh, let's do one last question before we close out here. Uh, here is an interesting thing. Uh, let's pick a, the, there was a four by four question here. What's the toughest, smallest, toughest four by four that's not a Jeep or a Bronco? So you, uh, that is interesting. Um, not a Jeep or a Bronco. You don't have a lot of options if you don't want a Jeep or a Ford product. Uh, well, if you uh, can go to the used market, I mean, you could look at a Toyota FJ Cruiser. Um, mm -hmm. That's not huge, and it's I'm very capable. I'm assuming you're talking new, though. They're probably talking new, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, you probably would have to pick up truck, or you would have to forerunner. Yeah. Because um, the RAV4, even if it, even in its uh, adventure trim, or TRD, off-road or TRD um, trims. Yeah, they don't get a full four-wheel drive system. Yeah, Especially so if they're know. not asking Bronco. I'm assuming if they're talking Bronco, they're talking Bronco Bronco and Jeep would be Wrangler. So in, right. in this contra construct, there's nothing nothing equivalent outside of a small pickup truck, a mid-sized pickup truck or a forerunner that would be affordable in this way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Maybe the Suzuki Jimny can come to the U.S. at some point and be an adorable little baby Wrangler at some point, but that is not an right. option at the moment, sadly. Well, yeah, yep, Suzuki. All bye right. Bye. Yep. So with that out of the way, it is nearly noon, and I promised a shorter episode, so I will uh, round this out by saying that we are going to be doing the giveaways, but I decided not to do them on the live stream. Uh, instead, everybody's going to get an email that won something and then it will be shipped out rather than wasting time with the sea of random pile of stuff that is all around here. Uh, so with that out of the way, be sure and stay tuned. There probably will not be a live show next week because I will be traveling all next week. But uh, there will be a bunch of videos coming up. So be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Hit the notifications button. Make sure that's active. Uh, there is the full review of the EV6. There's EV6 versus Mach-E. There is ID4, all-wheel drive. Uh, and there is Tucson Hybrid. And all of those are coming up soon. And Forrester, I guess, yeah. And Forrester, yes. Forrester yep. Wilderness mm -hmm. is in there somewhere. So uh, yep. we'll see all of you a little bit later. Two weeks, I promise. <laughs>